Today we're going to look at decision theory. Okay, how can we put a mathematical model on how people or organization make decisions? Okay, we want to go one step further of where we went so far. So far, we use machine learning in order to create models. Okay, in order to extract relationships from data. So we take the data and we are going to create a relation between the inputs, the outputs. Okay, now what we want to do is go one step further and use these models in order to model how a human or organization reason in order to take decisions that are going to be built on those empirical models. So the references for the class today are once again the book for the class in chapter 14 as well as chapter 16 in Russell and Norvig, Artificial Intelligence and a Modern Approach. Okay, so at the beginning of the class, we saw the fire example. Okay, to put you back in context, I was telling you, okay, at time T, I'm receiving a tweet on my phone. There's a fire in the building. We need to evacuate. Okay, the decision from most of you was just to do nothing. None of you evacuated. Why? And we, we went and we, we saw that process. Okay, we're just going to see it one more time here to bring it fresh in mind for everyone. So here... We have two possible states at the moment where I, I give you the information there's a fire. Either everything is even uh, everything is fine or there's a fire. And in, at that time, me, I was giving you the information, there's then there's actually a fire. Okay? And then we assign, we say that okay, if there's actually a fire, the likelihood that someone tells you there's a fire is 0.95 versus if everything is fine, the likelihood someone is going to mislead you into t giving you the information that there's a fire, let's assume it's 5%, 0.05. Okay, then given this information, why at the time no one reacted? It's because we have to consider not only the likelihood of the observation, but what was our prior knowledge, prior that I give you the, inform your, the information, that there was actually a fire. Okay, in that case, we can say that the probability that there was a fire, let's say one minute before I gave you the information, was a probability of 0.99 that everything was fine versus a probability of 0 0.01 that there was actually a fire. What happened in between these two time steps? Actually, we have some possible transition between the state. In the case where if everything was fine, there's a probability of 0.99 that everything was fine at time t, Versus there's a very small probability, let's assume 1%, that there was a fire that started in between those two time steps. Okay, <coughs> sorry. What happened if at time t minus 1, there was a fire? Okay, in that case, we assume that it was a certainty that this fire continued. Okay, if we combine the information coming from the prior probability of the state with the transition probability, as well as the likelihood associated with the information I gave you, we can compute at time t what is the probability of each state. And as we've seen before, this probability is 0.7 for everything is fine, 0.3 for a fire. Okay, what would that have happened as a time t plus 1 if a second person would give you the same information, okay, with the same likelihood associated with this information? We can now update based on these probability at time t, what would be our current probability for each at time t plus 1? It would be 0.9 for a fire, 0.1 for everything is fine, okay? So this, so far, is not related yet to decision, okay? Because we've only estimated what is our current knowledge for the probability of each state at time t or t plus 1. If we want to model the decision that each one of you would have take, we need to go one step further. OK, we need to look at what is the what are the possible action you can take and what are the utilities of each of those actions. OK, so if we look at time T at the first point where I gave you the information, we have the probability for each state. And now we assume we have only two possible actions. Either we run away and we evacuate or we stay put and wait. OK, described by those two pictograms. So the last step we need if we want to model the possible decisions is to assign utility, okay? What is the preference of each action with respect to the possible states? So remember, states are 
uh, fire, no fire, the action, evacuate or stay put. So here we can assign a utility of one for running if everything is fine versus 10 for running if there's actual fire. There's a utility of 10 for staying put if everything is fine versus 0 0.01 if there's a fire. So here it's not the absolute value of utility that matters, it's their relative value. And here, if we want to model the decision-making process, we're going to do this based on the expected utility. Okay, so here we're going to say 1 times 0 0.7 plus 10 times 0 0.3 is going to give me an expected utility of 3.7 versus 10 times 0 0.7 plus 0 0.01 times 3 is going to give me 7. So in this case, the expected utility uh, for staying put is 7, expected utility for running is 3.7. I want to pick the decision that's going to maximize my expected utility. So in that case, I would prefer to stay put. Okay. Obviously, the brain is not doing those calculations, but this is a simple way to mimic, to imitate what is the reasoning going on beyond behind human or organization's decision. Okay, what happened if at time t plus 1, now the probability has changed, so we went from 0.7 for everything is fine and 0.3 for a fire to 0 0.9 for a fire and 0 0.1 for everything is fine. So in that case, if we calculate the expected utility, I'm now at 9 for running versus 1 for staying put. The logical decision after two person gives you the independent information that there's a fire, I'm sure for everyone would have been to evacuate the room, okay? And this is what we're modeling here. What if we bring this in an engineering context, okay? We want to make rational decision regarding the contamination of soil, okay? We have contaminated soil everywhere across urban area. We want to build a new development. We want to check, are we building on some uh, uh, normal or contaminated soil, okay? So in that case, let's imagine that from an all industrial side we want to build on, we have one cubic meter of soil, okay? And here we know from the prior knowledge we have that the probability that this soil is not contaminated is 0 0.9. The probability that this soil is contaminated is 0 0.1, okay? Here, what are my action? Either here, keep calm, carry on, it means just do nothing, I'm just waiting, versus sending that cubic meter of soil to a recycling plant, okay? If I send the soil to a recycling plant, no matter what is the state, it's gonna cost me $100, versus if I keep calm and carry on, so do nothing, it's gonna cost me $0 if everything is fine. However, if I do nothing and it's actually contaminated, in future costs I'm gonna have, I can summarize these future costs as a loss of $10,000, okay? So here what we want to, to do is to use the same theory we used before in order to decide, given this knowledge of each state, the utility for possible actions given the state, what would be the optimal action to take given the information available? So what should we do? So in that case, we should base on decision on the expected loss associated with our case here. So, or the expected cost. So in this case, if you calculate the expected amount of dollar associated with each outcome, it's gonna be here zero, if, if uh, the expected uh, value associated with the action, so or conditional on action, is gonna be zero dollars times the probability of 90%. So if I decide to do nothing and it turned out to be not contaminated, plus minus $10,000 times a probability of 10%, okay? So if I do this operation, I'm gonna get an expected value conditional on I do nothing of minus $1,000. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing, but now for the second action. What is the expected value in dollar given that I take the action sending my cubic meter of soil to a recycling plant? In that case, it's going to be minus $100, minus $100 times a probability of 0.9 plus minus $100 times a probability of 0.1. So here, of course, is the same value for both, action, for both uh, outcomes. So it's going to be an expected value of minus $100.
So in that case, what would be the rational decision to do? It would be to choose, in this case, to recycle. So to send the cubic meter on the recycling plan because it has a higher expected value for you. Okay. If we want to model this decision using a tray, we could represent it here. Okay. So in this case, these are our four possible outcomes of each two state according to what is the decision that was taken. So either everything was fine and I decided to do nothing. So here the cost would be zero and the probability of this would be 0.9. What if it's contaminated and I decide to do nothing? It's going to cost me minus or the value is going to be minus $10,000 and the probability of that outcome is 0.1. Here, if I decide instead to recycle, okay, in this case, the uh, outcome would be $100 if it's not contaminated and the probability of that outcome was 0.9. If I decide to send to a recycling plant and it's actually contaminated, the cost is going to be minus $100 and the probability of that outcome is 0 0.1. So if we calculate the expected value given each possible action in my tree here, it's going to be minus $1,000 for doing not uh, for doing nothing it's going to be minus hundred dollar for sending to the recycling plant so in that case it's sending to the recycling plant that wins because it has the highest value the highest expected value okay so this is how we reason so here this tree is just another way to represent it we start to see it because we're going to reuse that representation for more complex decision later on Okay, in terms of nomenclature, we're going to say that my set A is my set of possible action A1, A2. Keep in mind, as I've done since the beginning of the class, these subscript, which look like a typeface, indicates the amount of elements in my set. Okay, so if he, since my variable is A, I have A possible action with that type, special typeface. So X is going to be my state variable. In the previous example was contaminated or not contaminated. So it could be either integers or categories, or it could be real quantities. So here in that module, we're going to stick to simple cases with discrete state variable. But you can generalize everything we're going to see here to continuous state variable, the same thing. Then we're going to say PR of X is going to be the probability of X. U of A and X is going to be the utility uh, we have for taking a given action A and being in a given state X. Okay, this is that uh, representation for the utility of taking an action and being in a given state. We can also represent our framework with either utility U or losses L. Okay, so it's the same thing now with the loss associated with taking a given action and being in a state x and here what you have to see it's these two are just equivalent equivalent framing of my problem where we're going to see in more detail later on i can see that my loss is equivalent to minus my utility okay it's just a framing of the problem either you speak some reference will speak in terms of losses some other reference will speak in terms of utility but you can always interpret the losses as being minus the utility Okay, so let's go back in a, a little deeper uh, in nomenclature with or soil contamination example. Okay, so the possible action AI belongs to the set do nothing or recycle. Okay, in a binary way, if we want to represent this with variable, we're not going to use pictograms. Okay, we can use a binary variable 0, 1. Same thing for my state. So my state is not contaminated or contaminated. Mathematically, we would not represent this with pictogram, we would represent this by a binary variable, for instance, 0, 1. Okay. Now I have the probability for my state. Okay, X is a state variable. I have a probability of 0.9 for my first state, not contaminated. I have a probability of 0 0.1 for my second state, it is contaminated. Okay. Then I can generalize to this, my uh, matrix like this one to describe what is my utility for a given action and a given state. So here's the utility for action and state. So the first row is action, the columns are state. So this one is the uh, utility for doing nothing while it's not contaminated. The utility of 
doing nothing while it's contaminated. The utility of sending to a recycling plant while it's not contaminated and the utility of sending to a recycling plant while it's contaminated. Okay, so right now we just look at the utility in terms of dollar values. We're going to add layers of refinement on this later on in the presentation. So we could add the equivalent representation of our problem here by saying that, as we saw just before, the utility can be represented as minus the loss. Okay, so here, by simply taking the negative value of what we have here, we can equivalently, equivalently represent our problem as the utility being minus the value for our losses. Okay, both are going to be equivalent. Okay, at the end, we need to define what is going to be for us a rational decision. Okay, and we want to define this in the context of expected utility maximization. Okay, so we're, what we're going to say is that the perceived benefit of an outcome xi, so the possible outcome from my state, and given that I've taken the action ai, is measured by either the expected utility or expected loss, depending on how I frame my problem. But these two, again, are equivalent. Okay, so what we're going to say is if I calculate my expected utility or expected loss, both are the same, it's going to be the weighted sum of the utility for taking in a given action and uh, being in a given state times the probability of that state, okay? My weighting is done by the probability of the state I'm in. So this is gonna be representing the expected utility of taking a given action. And here you see that the random variable is the state X, okay? I'm gonna sum here over my possible states. And in an equivalent way, I can represent the short end notation for expected utility as this U or L over bar of an action A. Okay, so either this representation or this representation are assumed to be equivalent. Okay, so what we're going to say that the optimal action A star is going to be the one that maximizes the expected utility or equivalently, is going to minimize the expected loss, okay? So A star, the star denotes the optimal action, okay? And we're going to say the action is optimal because it maximizes either the expected utility or equivalently, is going to minimize the expected loss. In both cases, it's always going to be the same action. So keep in mind, argmax is the argument A that maximizes this quantity, the argument A that minimizes this quantity. Okay, so here it is for the introduction. So what, where we are here is in decision making and RL. So decision making is going to be the entry door for us for the next module where we're going to see artificial intelligence and sequential decision problem. But before going there, we're going to set the foundation with decision theory. Okay, so what we're going to look at is decision theory and the underlying utility theory that we're going to cover in the next section. Then we're going to add some refinement associated with the definition of utility and loss function in order to take into account that the utility for someone might depend on this risk propension or aversion. Okay, how can we factor that in when we define utility or loss functions? And finally, we want to quantify, okay, what is going to be the value of actually collecting observations on in the real life in order to um, to uh, better understand what is the underlying states of our system okay by adding more information more knowledge there's usually a value associated with this how can we quantify that value okay we're going to see this true value of information so first, let's look at utility theory. Okay, what we're going to look at more specifically is what is the concept of a lottery and what are the axioms associated with utility theory. Okay, so we're going to define first uh, a lottery. Okay, and we're seeing this in order to see what is the, the common template in order to order preferences. Okay, so I'm going to define a lottery LI, my I at lottery, as being many possible outcomes okay so the outcomes are the x so x1 x2 just uh, to my x possible outcome 
and each outcome is associated with a probability of occurrence, okay? So each tuple that I can see here is a possible outcome associated with its probability. So in the case of the soil, uh, the contaminated soil or the soil contamination problem, I could have two lotteries. Each lottery would have been associated with one possible action. So my first lottery is what could have happened if I decide to recycle, okay? If I decide to send the volume of soil to a right recycling plant, there's a probability of one that is going to uh, be uh, not contaminated after treatment, and there's a probability of zero that the, the soil is going to be remain contaminated, okay? If I decide to take the second action, so the second lottery would be associated with doing nothing. If I do nothing from the previous problem, we saw that there's a probability of 0.9 that the soil is going to be fine. There's a probability of 0.1 that is going to actually be contaminated. Okay, so we could have frame our previous problem as being different lotteries we choose from depending on what action we're performing. Okay. So we're going to say that a decision maker is going to have some is going to express some preferences, okay? So here we can say that the decision maker prefer, prefers the lottery LI over LJ, okay? So this is the symbol we're going to use to describe the preferences between two lotteries. If we have no preferences, we're indifferent between the two lotteries, we're going to say LI tilled LJ, okay? Meaning the decision maker is indifferent between those two lotteries. If Li is prefer or equivalent to Lj, we're going to use that uh, greater or equal. Okay, so now how do we define utility, utility theory from its axiom? Okay, that are going to define what is a rational, a rational behavior. So the first axiom is orderability. Okay, it means that exactly one of these three old. So either I'm um, greater, um, I prefer Li over Lj, I prefer Lj over Li, or Li is equivalent to Lj. Then the second axiom is transitivity. It means that if I prefer Lj, uh, Li over Lj, and I prefer Lj over Lk, it also means that I prefer, I prefer Li over Lk. This is what we have here. This is a transitivity, uh, transitivity, transitivity axiom. Then we have the axiom of continuity, okay? If I say that I prefer Li over Lj and Lj over Lk, it also means that it exists a probability P such that I can have this lottery. So with probability P, I'm gonna obtain the lottery Li and with the complement one minus P, the lottery K, okay? And this lottery is equivalent to Lj, the one that I have in the middle. The fourth axiom is substitu substituability, where if Li, I'm indifferent between Li and Lj, then these two lotteries are equivalent, okay? I have a probability P of obtaining Li and the complement one minus P of obtaining Lk. So because Li and Lj, I'm indifferent, I can build an equivalent lottery where instead of being a probability P of obtaining Li, it's a probability P of obtaining Lj. Okay, so these two, I can substitute uh, Li or Lj with respect to another lottery I would want to build. There is the axiom of monotonicity, where if I prefer Li over Lj, then we can say that for a probability P greater than another probability Q, so greater or equal, uh, we can, we're going to prefer the lottery with probability P of obtaining Li versus one minus P, it's complement of obtaining LJ. So this lottery is gonna be preferred over a lottery Q of obtaining LI versus one minus Q of obtaining LJ. Because remember, the probability P was larger or equal to Q. So I prefer that I occur, the LI occur with higher probability uh, than with a smaller probability, okay? And finally, the last axiom is decomposability. It means that the decision maker won't take any no fun in the gambling process itself. So it means this theory would be unsuited if we would try to model the behavior of someone going to play in a casino, because most people that go and play in a casino take fun. They go play in the casino because they, 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 they gain some fun 
into the playing itself, okay? So this here is not factored in this utility theory. Okay, so now we're gonna dig a little deeper in how do we define either utility or loss functions, okay? Why? Because we want to be able to model the behavior of human, which can either display some risk-seeking or risk-averse behaviors, okay? And we're gonna see how that we can do this through nonlinear utility functions, okay? And we're gonna see how we can express these utility and loss functions as a function of V, the phase value we were using before, for instance, in terms of dollars, okay? And then we're gonna see how we define the expected utility in terms of value and how does it explain the risk averse behavior we see often either for individual or organization. Okay, from the axiom we, we defined earlier, this is what's defining my utility theory, okay? So then we can relate the lottery we had before with utility uh, values, okay? So if I prefer the lottery Li over the lot, if the utility of the lottery Li is greater or equal to the utility of the lottery Lj, it means that I prefer the lottery I over the lottery J. <coughs> Sorry. If the utility of the lottery Li is equal to the utility of lottery Lj, it means that I'm indifferent between the lottery Li and the lottery Lj. So now what we need to define is what is the expected utility of a lottery, okay? The expected utility of the lottery we define here, so this was the previous definition we had for, for the lottery, is going to be the probability for the ith outcome, so that we have here, times the utility of that outcome, okay? This is how we define the expected utility of a lottery. Then one interesting uh, fact uh, we have with utility is that imagine that we want to transform our utility using a linear function, okay, or an affine function in this case, where we say we're going to take our utility for a possible state x and we're going to multiply by coefficient w plus here uh, bias b, okay, so to obtain a, a transform utility function, okay, so here if w is greater than zero, it means that my utility or the optimal action the, uh, resulting from a rational decision is gonna be the same whether I take this decision based on u of x or whether I take this decision based in the transform space, okay? So it means that the optimal action for a utility that I'm gonna multiply by a positive constant or for which I'm gonna add a bias, it's not going to change, okay? And this explains why we were saying before that the loss can be expressed as minus the utility, okay? So we say if the loss is, is equivalent to minus the utility, it means that my optimal action A is the one that, the argument A that maximize my expected utility, okay? But here, since W is smaller than zero, so it's minus one, then I need to reverse my argument. Okay, I'm gonna say my optimal action is now the one that minimizes the expected loss, okay? This is because I have the negative sign here, okay? But if I use any other kind of coefficient that's not gonna change the sign, it doesn't change my optimal action I'm gonna take, okay? Okay, so let's look now at the preference and so how can we relate this to risk seeking and risk averse behavior okay so let's build an example where i offer you the opportunity to take a lottery okay we have two possible lottery in the first lottery i'm gonna flip a coin okay so there's a 50 50 percent probability of either a landing on head or tail and what i'm telling you is if it lands on head so with that probability 0 0.5, you're gonna gain $200, okay? If it lands on tail, you have a probability of 0 0.5 of that outcome, there's a loss of $100. You're gonna give me $100, okay? This is the first lottery you can choose. I tell you, there's a second choice you have, is to do nothing, 
okay? You just pass on that lottery. So in that case, if you pass, the outcome is a certainty. You have a probability one of neither you're gonna lose or gain anything, okay? So we have two lottery, either you decide to flip the coin with these two possible outcomes, probability of 0.5, you gain 200, probability of 0.5, you lose 100, or the second lottery is you just decide to pass. We know for sure what's gonna happen. You neither are gonna win or lose anything. So the question is, which lottery do you choose and why? And actually, when we ask this question, most people would decide to, okay? We're gonna see how we make that reasoning. So the expected uh, financial uh, value of the first lottery is gonna be one half times $200 plus one half times minus $100. Okay, we're just calculating the expected value of that utility. Okay, the expected value is plus $50 if you decide to play. Okay, versus the expected value of doing nothing is going to be $0. Okay, so from a rational decision as we've framed it so far, the expected value, uh, the highest expected value would be lead you to choose to play, okay? But actually, when we ask most people, would you play that lottery? Most people would answer, no, I wouldn't play. Why is that? Does it mean that they, these people are being irrational, okay? And I'm pretty sure that many of you listening now would have chosen not to go and take the bet, would have preferred the sure outcome of saying, I'm going to pass and I'm happy with not winning or losing anything. Okay, we're going to go in more detail and explain that decision behavior. And don't worry, you're not being irrational here. It's because what we've seen so far is incomplete. Okay, because for individual, the utility of a gain or the loss of that gain are nonlinear. Okay, what does it mean? Is that we need to factor in risk aversion or risk seeking behavior into our utility function as a function of a value, for instance, monetary value, okay? So U of V is the utility of a given value. In this case, we're gonna consider a monetary value, okay? It's gonna weight, what it, the utility is gonna weight the monetary value as a function of a decider aversion or propension towards risk, okay? And that takes into account for the fact that Gaining or losing $1 is not going to have the same perceived effect, whether you already only have $1 or if you already have a million dollars. Okay, imagine if all you have in life is $1 and I tell you, you lose that dollar, you lose everything you have. If you have $1 and you gain $1, you double everything you have. Okay, the difference into what you have or have not is big. Whereas if you already have a, top, a million dollars, okay, gaining or losing one dollar doesn't make any difference, okay? You don't care about this. So you need to include this into our decision framework, okay? And to do this, we need to have nonlinear utility or loss functions. So here's an example where on the horizontal axis, we have the value, okay? We normalize the ranges between zero and one for the value, zero and one for the utility. Okay, so, so far, all the utility or loss function we've defined were like this red line, which means risk neutral. What does it mean? If I have a value of zero, I have a utility of zero. If I have a value of one, I have a utility of one. And if I have a utility of a value of 0.5, I'll also have a utility of 0.5. Okay, this isn't a case where I have a risk neutral perception with respect to uh, risk. Okay. Then what happens if I have a risk averse behavior? I'm gonna have a nonlinear function, such as the blue one here, where for a value of 0.5, my utility is gonna be greater than 0.5. And on the opposite, if instead of being risk averse, I'm risk seeking, I'm gonna be having a nonlinear utility function, such as the yellow one here, such that for a value of 0.5, my utility is lower than 0.5, okay? And in general, both people and organization are risk averse, okay? They want to avoid catastrophic cost, catastrophic consequences, 
Okay, so if we want to model in a simple way these nonlinear utility function, we can, as a function of the value v, we can use as a simple function v to the power k, where for k greater than 1, this is representing the yellow curve here, I'm going to be risk-seeking. If I have k equal 1, I'm going to have that risk-neutral position, and if I have k between 0 and 1, this is going to be the blue cur curve here, this is going to model a risk-averse behavior. Okay, if we want to reason in terms of losses rather than utility, this is the same thing. But now the curves are reversed. So the red one in the middle is still a risk neutral behavior. The blue one on the bottom is now the risk averse. The yellow one on top is the risk seeking. Okay, and now it's just the coefficients that are reversed. So k greater than 1 is risk averse. k between 0 and 1 is going to be risk seeking. OK, we can still model this nonlinear loss by v to the power k, where now the coefficients have been flipped. OK, and here what we have to keep in mind is that only uh, neutral attitudes toward the risk is going to maximize the expected value over multiple decisions. Equivalently, we can say that a neutral attitude toward risk is going to minimize the expected cost over multiple decisions. What does it mean? It means that if you want to maximize the financial value of your decision, you always have to put yourself in a risk neutral position. OK, any other position, whether it's risk averse or risk seeking, is going to long term over multiple decision leads to uh, outcome that have a lower expected financial value. OK. And at the end, that's why I explain the, the existence in the business model of insurers, okay? Because what insurers do is that they are always going to put themselves into neutral attitudes toward risk, okay? And the insured people that buy the policies from the insurers are going to be risk averse, which means that they're going to accept to pay a premium in order to be sure that they're not into a risk neutral position. So they're going to be typically risk averse. And to avoid being in a risk neutral position, they're going to pay a premium to the insurers that him himself is going to be in a risk neutral position. So basically the insurer, what it does, it calculates for you that subscribe to the premium, what is going to be the expected cost he's going to pay for you. Then on top of this is going to add a premium for its operating costs plus a premium for its profit. So at the end, you're paying a premium for not being in the neutral attitude toward risk. So are you being irrational when you take uh, an insurance? The answer to this is it depends. OK, there are some situations where you need to place yourself. You cannot afford to place yourself in a risk neutral position. Why? Because here we say that the, the, the best thing to do is to be in the risk neutral position if you can play multiple times. So if you can take multiple decisions. But imagine that you buy yourself a new house. That house might be worth several thousand, hundred thousands of dollars. OK, you buy your new house and the house burned down. OK, you still have a mortgage for that house and you don't have any more house. It's not insured and you have to cover the loss and buy a new house. So obviously, you most likely cannot afford to do this. So your life is going to be ruined. Your life as you know it is never going to be the same. OK, so the, the losses you face, even if the expected value of the loss is greater if you're in a risk neutral position, the consequences of the outcome occurring are so great that you must avoid them at all costs. OK, on the other hand, the insurer is not only insuring you, he's insuring thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of houses. OK, and the probability that each of the houses burn at the same time is extremely low. So you know that even if for some houses are going to burn and you can definitely it was going to be the expected cost for all of those houses burning. But at the end, from years to years, there was going to be a very small variation over the expected cost associated with the fires just because it has a large pool of individual on which to diversify its risk. OK, so in the case of one individual, the fire would be catastrophic 
on its quality of life, on its possibility to bounce back in life. Because if you lose, you won't be able to play again. You won't be able to buy another house to make up that will never burn, to make up for the losses you, you have in the first house that burned. Okay, so here we have to reason in terms of will you be able to play multiple times in order to really have a game that will tend towards the expected value that we're looking at. Okay, in case of insurance, since they can diversify their risk over a pool of insured people, they can afford to be uh, risk neutral. But what happens if we look at something like flooding. So when we have flooding, there can be multiple houses that are going to be flooded at the same time, meaning that the losses for a same insurer could be extremely large. So that's why even insurers for some specific risk, they cannot diversify enough their, uh, their risk. So they cannot diversify enough the events they might have to cover. So in such case, this is why they are reinsured. Okay. Insurance company for insurance company that's going to diversify the risk for different location so that if a catastrophic event happened in one part of the globe, the, the same event is not going to affect the other part of the globe. So at the end, at that larger scale, the risks are going to be ch uh, shared across multiple people. And overall, from years to years, there's going to be small fluctuation with respect to the expected cost that was calculated by the insurer, okay? So this is the, the thinking that goes behind the insurer. So at the end, the bottom line is what? If you can easily cover the expenses associated with an event, you should not take an insurance for it because at the end, what everything you're doing is passing over a profit to the insurer. However, for something where you can't absorb the loss associated with the potential event, you must absolutely uh, be insured. For instance, in case of a fire in your house, there would be no reasonable argument for not being covered by such an insurance because if your house burn, you most likely won't have the financial capacity to bounce back. However, if you're buying yourself a new laptop and you have to decide whether or not to buy this extra insurance uh, at the shop when you purchase it, you might have to think twice. Can I afford to pay for the repair in case something happened? Or do I really need that warranty extension? Okay, then you have to make the, the decision based on will you be able to bounce back if the event happened? Okay, so if we look at this in terms of the uh, soil contamination example we had before. So everything we defined before, we define in terms of monetary value. Okay, but if we want to factor in the potential either risk aversion or risk seeking behavior, we need to pass that value into our utility function that can be either like the blue one or the yellow one, depending if we if we are risk averse or risk seeking. Okay, so at the end, we're going to base our decision that's going to factor in that risk aversion or risk propension behavior based on the expected utility evaluated for the value of the possible outcome given the action we have taken. Okay, so let's look a little more in detail why nonlinear function represent these risk seeking or risk averse behavior. Okay, and I build a specific tailored example to illustrate this. So here we're going to look at the expected utility for the value of taking an action AI given a state X, okay, where X is a random variable. And we're going to say, how does this translate into either risk averse or risk seeking behavior? So here, what we have on the bottom graph here is the, on the horizontal axis, the value for possible outcome X, okay? And here I represent the possible outcomes for two possible action, either action A1 or action A2. So in orange, it's going to be action A1, and blue is going to be the action A2. So we see that for each action, there are two possible outcomes, okay? We don't know yet which outcome is going to occur. But if I choose the blue action A1, these are the two possible outcomes, and the respective i of each stem 
represent the probability of each outcome. So the probability, the action A2 is represented by these orange here uh, stems, where the height of each stem represents the probability of each outcome. And here I tailor made this example so that the expected value for action one or the expected value of action two, both are equal. Okay. In the first case, let's consider if we have a neutral attitude toward risk. So if we have a neutral attitude toward risk, we're going to have that linear function that links the value and the utility. Okay. And in that case, what I represent on the top left graph would be on the vertical axis, the utility on the horizontal axis would be the uh, probability for the utility associated with the value conditional of on an action taken and acts a state. Okay. So in this case, since it's a one to one linear transformation, both the expected value, the expected utility for both action are equivalent. Okay. The expected value for both action were equal. The expected utility are equal because I have a linear utility function, which is risk neutral. What if instead of being risk neutral, I have a non uh, a risk averse perception, such as I'm not in a neutral position anymore. So in that case, even if the expected value are still equal, now the expected utilities are not going to be equal anymore because of the, the shift that is introduced by the nonlinear function. Okay. So the position of each uh, stem now evaluate through the nonlinear function. I look at the position of this stem, position of this stem and this stem. If I look at the expected value in my transform space, the solid line on top is the expected value for action A2. The blue solid line is the expected value for action A1. So what we see now is that even if the expected value were initially equal, after passing them into a nonlinear risk averse function, I'm going to have a higher expected utility for action A2 than for A1. Why is that? Here, if we look at the particularity of action A2, is that the two outcome have less spread, less variability than action A1, which has a higher variability. So what it means, it means that risk averse decision maker will prefer more certain outcome over more uncertain one. So we can see that here we have more variability in the possible outcome for action A2. That's why it has a higher expected, expected utility over the action uh, A1, which has higher, uh, higher variability in the possible outcomes. OK, if instead of modeling uh, risk averse behavior, as we do here, we would have a risk seeking behavior. This nonlinear function would be in the other direction. And here, the order of the two curve would be flipped. It means that the risk seeking person would favor or would prefer the outcome with more variability over the outcome with lower variability. So this was for the discrete case. When I talk about the discrete case, I'm not talking about action. I'm talking about the possible outcome for a state X. But X now can be not only discrete, could be continuous. OK, so in that case, if I take action A1, this would be the protein density function describing what are the possible actions. If I take the action A2, this is the PDF describing the possible outcomes for action A2. OK, and again, both have the same expected value. Now, on this graph, I have my utility function. This axis is value. This, action, this axis is utility. If I have a risk neutral perception, I'm going to have that linear function. OK, and I'm going to see that the expected values were equal. The expected utilities were the expected uh, values were equal. The expected utilities are equal as well because I have a risk neutral position. If I adopt a risk averse uh, behavior, it's going to look like this where even if I add initially ex equal expected value, I don't have equal expected utility as an output. So in this case, the expected utility of action A2 is larger than the expected utility of action A1. Why? Because there's less spread in the possible outcome of the action A2 over action A1. Okay. So if it would be the reverse perception, so we would have a risk averse uh, behavior. 
So if we'd have a, a risk-seeking behavior, the curve would be in the other direction. And in such a case, uh, we would have prefer the action leading to the more spread in the possible outcomes. Okay, so now we're going to look at value of information. Okay, we have uncertainty about the state of the real world. Okay, how can we quantify the value associated with collecting more information to better know what is the real state of the world and evolving it? Okay, and we're going to see this for two specific cases, either the value of perfect information. So in the case where the value I'm going to collect is going to exactly tell me what is the state of the world versus the second case with value of imperfect observation, imperfect information. What is the value of an observation or information that's going to be uh, imperfect about the, the true state of the world? Okay, so we're going to look at the expected utility of collecting information first. Okay, in case where the value of a state X is imperfectly known, so this is the case we've treated since the beginning of this module, we can say that the expected utility of uh, for an optimal action A star, uh, given uh, the possible state X, is going to be the max over the action, so that's why we have that A star, of the sum over all possible x's of the utility of both taking an action and being a state times the probability of that state, okay? And this is the long form here, the expected utility of the optimal action given the state. We can write it in this short form. So overline u of a star, okay? Both are equivalent short and or long end formulation. Now, what happened if I can collect a given observation y that tell me exactly what state am I in. So I'm telling me my state y is, for instance, the soil is not contaminated. But in that case, given that I know the utility for uh, the action, given that I know the state, I could directly maximize, okay? It means that I can directly end pick what would be the optimal action that will maximize my utility given that I now know the state because I've observed it, okay? So the utility of action given that I know the state is always going to be better than this expected utility, okay? But what is the issue here? Is that before collecting the observation, I don't know what's going to be the observation. It can both go either way. So it means that we must consider all the possible observations according to their probability because we're one step ahead. We haven't yet received the observation. We want to quantify what is the value of that observation. And the value of observation depends on what could that observation be, okay? So here, the uh, expected value of, uh, of the expected utility conditional on obs um, uh, perfect observation. So this is the conditional, the expected value, the expected utility conditional on perfect information is going to be the sum over all possible state of my system. So all possible X of the maximum of my utility times the probability. So before just the expected utility was the max of the sum. Okay. So now you can see that if I assume that I'm going to know, depending on what's the outcome, what is the actual state of the system, I can push the max inside my sum. What's the difference? is that now, instead of weighting each utility with its probability and then summing, is that I can already maximize my utility. Meaning that for each possible state xi, I'm going to pick the best action, the one that maximizes the utility. And then I'm going to weight that possible outcome times the probability of that state. And then I'm going to sum over all possible state here, okay? So what we have to realize here is that this expected utility is always going to be lesser or equal to the expected utility conditional on perfect uh, information. So we can quantify VPI, my value of perfect information, where my information is my observation Y, as the difference between the expected utility conditional on perfect information, 
minus the expected utility that we calculated previously. And this is a quantity that is strictly larger or equal to zero, okay? Because gaining inf information is always going to have a value that is lesser or I can, this is greater or equal to not having that information. So now for our soil contamination example, we define the utility for taking an action and being in a given state, okay? So the possible state are the, it's not contaminated or it's contaminated, and the possible action is I send the volume of soil to the recycling plan or I do nothing, okay? And I have a financial value associated with each of them, the same value we defined earlier. So here we make the assumption that our utility uh, has a neutral uh, position with respect to risk. So we don't have, we don't introduce any nonlinearity here. So as we've seen before, we can calculate the current expected utility conditional on action. Okay. The expected utility, uh, given that we decide to do nothing is going to be zero dollars times the probability of being in a no, not contaminated state. So 0.9 plus uh, minus $10,000 times a 10% probability of being actually contaminated. Okay, because keep in mind, the probability of being not contaminated was 0.9, being contaminated was 0 0.1. Okay, so 0 0.9 times 0 plus 0 0.1 times minus 10,000. So the expected value is minus $1,000. The expected utility of taking the action of recycling here is going to be uh, minus $100 times 0.9, plus minus $100 times 0.1. So in this case, it's trivial, it's gonna be minus $100. So here, the best action we should pick is the one with the highest expected utility is gonna to be to recycle. So if we just decide to recycle in that context, the expected utility is gonna be minus $100, okay? Now, what is the expected utility? Conditional on perfect information, okay? We haven't collected the information yet. But we want to know, we want to quantify what is going to be the value if before taking the uh, action, someone tells me what is the true state of the system, okay? So in that case, we need to sum the min of, uh, here there's a little typo, it's not the min, it's going to be the max. So the maximum, and is it the same thing here? So this one, no, this one is okay. So a little typo here, it's not min, it's gonna be the max of my utility times the probability of the state, okay? So here, keep in mind that min should be max because we wanna either minimize losses or maximize utility. So it's gonna be the max of utility. So in that case, if my state is everything is fine, so the observation tells me your soil is not contaminated. So if it, I'm not contaminated, the best outcome is to do nothing, $0. So zero dollars times a probability of 0.9 of being in that state. So this is what I have here. Plus, if my observation tell me I'm contaminated. So in that case, it's gonna be a best action of sending to a recycling plan because it has a higher uh, utility times a probability of being in that state of 0 0.1. So if I'll calculate this expected utility conditional on perfect information, it's gonna be minus $10. So the value of perfect of information, VPI, is the difference between that expected utility conditional on perfect information minus the expected utility conditional on simply the actions we could be taking. So it's gonna be minus $10 minus minus $100. So the outcome is $90. So what does it mean? The actual value that I perceive for collecting that perfect information is worth to me $90, okay? So in that case, I would be willing to pay up to $90 in order to have, before taking my decision, the observation that tells me whether I am my soil is contaminated or not, okay? So, and here, in terms of nomenclature, we can either use this long form or this short form. So this is the expected utility conditional on perfect information, simply the expected utility I have here. Okay, and we can once again represent this using a decision tree. So this is the same utility function we defined earlier, and we can represent this as a tree. Okay, so we have a 
y is our observation of the state. So in that case, given it's perfect observation and the probability of everything is fine is 90%, probability that I'm contaminated is 10%, I have a 90% probability that the actual observation I'm going to receive is it's not contaminated. On the opposite, I have a 10% probability that the actual observation I'm going to receive is I'm contaminated. Okay? So depending on what's the state, I must choose an action. Either do nothing or send to the recycling plant. If I chose to do nothing, I have two possible states. So either everything is fine or it's contaminated. But since here I have already access to perfect information, it means that if the observation tells me I'm contaminated, the probability that I'm not contaminated, the probability of being contaminated is zero versus I'm certain of being not contaminated. So in this case, the utility is zero dollar if I choose to do nothing versus if I choose to send to the recycling plan. In that case, if the state, the observation is it's not contaminated, I know I cannot go there. So there's a probability of one. It's a certainty. I'm not going to, going to be contaminated. The, co the utility is going to be minus hundred dollars. So here the reasoning is that if my observation is everything is fine, I'm going to pick the action with the highest utility means doing nothing. On the other branch of my tree, with probability 0.1, I'm going to receive the information that my soil is actually contaminated. In such a case, uh, if I decide to do nothing, I know that I have a probability zero of being contaminated because my observation already told me I'm contaminated. So the only branch is here. I have a certainty that it's going to cost me minus $10,000 because I'm contaminated and I do nothing. So this is what I have here. On the other hand, if I'm I have the information that I'm contaminated and I decide to send to a recycling plant, I know I cannot be not contaminated because I already received the information. It's a certainty that's going to cost me $100. Okay, I decide to recycle and I'm contaminated, $100 cost. So here the best path to choose or the best action to choose is to recycle. So now I'm going to have a utility of minus $100 with probability of 0.1 and zero dollars with probability of 0.9. This is what is calculating my expected utility, conditional on perfect information, okay? So now the last thing we wanna see is, okay, in practice, we don't always have access to such perfect information, okay? Uh, or before this, uh, we're gonna wrap up by seeing the value of information is gonna represent how much you're gonna be willing to pay for information, but now the challenge with reality is that what if the information you receive is not perfect? Okay, whenever you con conduct tests in real life or whenever you receive the information, there's always a possibility that that information is not perfectly representative of the true state of the world. And you need that to factor that in. Okay, so that's why we're going to go one step further with quantifying the value of imperfect information. Okay, so here we have the expected utility of imperfect, of conditional on imperfect observation or imperfect information. So now what we have is that we need to take the sum over all the possible observation y, where we're going to take here inside that parenthesis the action a that's going to maximize what's inside here. And what's inside here is that we're going to sum over the utility of taking an action A and being in a state X times the joint probability of X and Y. So a state and a given observation. And that joint probability is the product of the prior probability of being in a given state times the likelihood of an observation given a state X or a conditional probability of an observation Y given a state X. Okay, so here we sum, what we're going to have is the utility times the joint for y and x. We're going to sum over x. And here we're going to choose the action that maximizes the quantity here. Then what we're going to do, uh, so basically what we do by that max is that we always pick the utility, which has the highest value here. And then what we're going to do, we're going to sum this quantity over all possible observation y's. Okay, this is the long form for the expected utility of action conditional on imperfect information. So this is the long form. This is the short form.
Okay, we're going to break that down through our, again, soil contamination example. So in that case, this is the same formulation we just saw. We need to define the first thing is going to be our utility for taking an action and being in a state X. Okay, this is the same table we've seen over and over in this class. Then we need to define that conditional probability of observing something given the underlying state of the system X. Okay, so here we can model this by this conditional probability. So if the soil is not contaminated, the probability of saying that it's not contaminated, we're going to assume it's one. So by complement, the probability of receiving information that it's not contaminated, if it's actually not, uh, the probability of receiving information that it is contaminated, given that it, the true state is not contaminated, is going to be the complement, so zero. On the other hand, if the soil is contaminated, the probability of receiving information that it's actually contaminated is 0.95. So we have an imperfect observation. And by the complement, the probability that if the soil is really contaminated, we're going to have the, the observation that it's actually fine and not contaminated is going to be the complement. So 1 minus 0.95, 5%. Then we can build from the prior uh, knowledge we had. So we knew from the prior, the previous example that our prior knowledge was that the prior probability of the soil being contaminated is 10%. The probability of it not being contaminated was 90%. Okay. If we combine that prior knowledge with this conditional probability for observation by taking the product, we can build the joint probability for both state and observation. Okay, this is what we have here. So these are the possible observation, the not contaminated, contaminated, and the possible state. Okay, so here the drawing probability of being not contaminated and receiving the information that I'm not contaminated is going to be 0.9, the prior probability of not being contaminated, times a certainty that if I'm not contaminated, I'm going to receive the information that I'm not contaminated. So 0.9 times 1, it's 0.9. What is the probability that if I'm not contaminated, I'm going to receive the information that I am contaminated, okay? So the joint probability of both happening simultaneously is going to be 0.9 times 0, because the complement here for this conditional probability is going to be 0. So there's no chance that if I'm not contaminated, I'm going to receive a wrongful information. On the other hand, if I'm not, I am uh, contaminated, the probability of receiving the rightful information that I'm actually not contaminated is going to be my prior probability of not being contaminated, 0 0.1, and times the likelihood of receiving information, 0.95. So this is the joint probability of receiving information and being in the same state contaminated. The joint probability for being contaminated and receiving the opposite information is the probability, 0.1, times a likelihood of 1 minus 0 0.95, 0 0.05, so 0 0.005, uh, for the joint probability of Y being not contaminated, Y, X being contaminated. Okay, so now if we apply this formula, these are the number we have. And the first thing I want you to look at is the outermost subgroup. So the first subgroup we have on the left made of these two global terms is the possibility that the observation is we're not contaminated. The second outer subgroup is the probability of receiving the information or the possibility associated with the observation, which will be why is contaminated. OK, we are going to look at that a little more closer through the same uh, decision tree we had before. OK, so now what we have here, we have our observation Y, which can take two branches, either we are uh, not contaminated, or at least the observation tell us we're not contaminated, or the opposite, or observation tell us that we are contaminated. But now, what are the probability of these outcomes? Here it's 0.905 and 0 0.095. How did I obtain these? I have my joint probability here. So if I want to obtain the marginal probability of Y, I simply sum to marginalize this joint probability. So if I sum here over all possible X, so 0.9 plus 0 0.005, 0 0.905. If I want the marginal probability of Y equals contaminated, I sum those two, 0 0.095. Okay, these are my two probability that I have here. So if I receive the information that I'm actually contaminated, 
I still have to choose between two actions, either doing nothing or sending my soil to a recycling plant. How do I decide between those two outcomes? Okay, here I decide based on which one is gonna have the highest expected utility, okay? So here, the probability of that branch here leading to, I receive the, uh, I, I decide to do nothing and I'm gonna be in a not contaminated situation where my utility is gonna be zero dollar, okay? The probability of this happening is 0 0.9 divided by 0 0.905. That 0 0.9 is actually uh, extracted from that joint probability table. So really that branch is 0 0.9, that branch is 0 0.05. Okay, and here, if I want to have the, the marginal probability for this branch, I need to divide by this 0.905 because the joint is going to be this times this. Okay, the joint, if I multiply these two, I'm really going to obtain that 0.9 and that 0.005. On the other end, if I do the same thing for the action recycling, I can look at my table here. It's again 0.9 and 0 0.005 for the two probability for each branches, okay? So if I calculate the expected utility conditional on each possible action, so it's gonna be zero dollars times uh, 0.9 divided 0.905, 10,000 K over 0 0.05 times 0.905, I'm gonna obtain here minus 55.25. Versus here, if I do the same thing for the action of sending to a recycling plan, I'm gonna obtain minus $100. So what it means here is that if I receive the information that the soil is not contaminated, the best thing I should do is do nothing because it has a higher expected utility. On the other hand, if I receive the information that I'm not contaminated, I still have to choose between two actions where the probability of each branch, which is the same in two, the two case, is given by these two con the joint probabilities, 0 and 0 0.095, the 0 and 0 0.095. And the divider I have here in both cases, it's because here the joint is obtained by the probability of the observation times this conditional probability to obtain the joint for each possible outcome. In that case, the expected utility in the case I do nothing, minus $10,000 versus the expected utility if I send to a recycling plan is going to be minus $100. So this one is going to be the best action to pick from. So in that case, this is exactly what we have here, okay? So in that case, if the action is everything is fine, so the best thing I should do is to uh, recycle my material. Uh, no, it's to do nothing, sorry. So if I do nothing, I'm gonna have a probability of 0.9 times zero plus 0 0.005 times minus 10,000 K. This is what I have here, okay? So this, uh, action of picking the action with the maximal utility is that max I have here. Then I do with my second branch here, which goes there. What if my action or my observation is that it's actually contaminated? In that case, the best action to take is to send to the recycling plant, where I'm going to have a loss of minus $100 with probability of zero and uh, minus $100 with a probability of 0 0.095. So if I make that calculation, the expected utility conditional and imperfect observation is going to be here minus $59.5. Okay. Now, if we continue this example because we want to quantify the value of information, okay, we calculate at the beginning of this uh, presentation what will be the expected utility for the optimal action. So, in that case, we cal already calculated it's going to be minus $100. Here, we just calculated in the previous slide, the expected utility conditional on imperfect information would be minus $59.5. So here, the value of imperfect information would be the difference between that minus 59.5 minus minus $100. So the result is $40.5. So I would be willing to pay up to $40.5 to have access to that imperfect observation. And note that before, the value of perfect information was uh, $90. And now that I have imperfect information, its value diminishes. It's now 40.5. Okay, the ultimate case where the information becomes perfect, my value will raise up to $90. So if we recap what we've seen together, so first, 
to define an optimal or a rational decision is going to be the action A star that's going to either minimize the expected loss or maximize the expected utility, where keep in mind the utility can be framed as minus the losses. Okay, so at the end, rational decision, keep in mind, is the action that's going to maximize the expected utility. So the utility and loss function we define are going to be there to quantify or either risk aversion or propension uh, or, or behavior which are either risk averse or risk seeking. Okay, that factors in the effect that gaining or losing one dollar is not going to have the same effect whether you only already have one dollar or if you already have a million dollars. Okay, and we have some nonlinear utility function like this, where the blue one with a coefficient k greater than one would be for risk averse, or the yellow one here would be for risk seeking. And the uh, red one you can see here is going to be the risk neutral position. And it's going to be the one actually maximize. If you follow that risk behavior, you're going to maximize the expected monetary value for the decision you're doing. OK, for value information, uh, this is the quantifying the value you should be able to you should be willing to pay for having access to a perfect information ahead of taking your decision. It's going to be the difference between the expected utility of an action minus the expected utility, conditional and perfect information. And this is always strictly uh, greater or equal to zero. So the value of perfect information uh, or the expected value of perfect information here, I should have written, is either in the long form or the short form, the sum over all possible values of x for the maximum of the utility, okay? So instead of the max being outside of the sum, the max is now inside of the sum. So you pick the, for a given state X, the best action, and you weigh that utility times the probability of that state. For the expected uh, utility of imperfect information, so in that case, we're gonna have uh, here the sum over all possible observation, you pick the optimal action for each possible state. In the case, you're going to sum over all possible state for the utility evaluated for that best action times the joint probability for both observation and state. OK, that concludes what I wanted to see you. This is the building blocks which will allow us to continue with the next module where we're going to extend this decision theory for doing sequential decision. And this is going to be the, the foundation for defining um, reinforcement learning and artificial intelligence application.